Ja. 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 Ah, there she is. Mm. Oh, just swipe on it. You see me? Yes, I do. I see you. <laughs> Fantastic. I'm just trying to pin a uh, new daughter of Africa. I have to turn up the sound a bit. That's fine. I'll speak up. Okay, you speak up. You know I'm deaf. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Definitely blind. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely excited that you could join today for our very final Afrolit Sans Frontiers. And um, first question: When is the paperback coming out? Is it out already? No, I think it'll be out at the beginning of September, right? Um, something like December the third. So any minute now. Hold, don't hold your breath too long. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic, everyone in the audience. How are you? Thank you. I'm very excited to be hosting um, Miss Margaret Busby. I call her Auntie Margaret, but only I can call her that. <laughs> Not all of you can them. call me Margaret. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm very delighted. Uh, this is a woman who has done so much in history, in publishing, in literature. I think, you know, you inspire me. I'm like, when I grow up, I want to be you. <laughs> like so much. You do so many wonderful things. Thank you, Zuki. Okay, so here's a question. My first question, obviously, is about uh, Alison and Busby, mm -hmm. which was the publishing company that you founded. And um, it's you... It's this, actually. Yeah. But I'm no longer with it. No, I'm, I'm very aware of that. So my first question was, um, you know, at the time when you, when you founded it, it was way back uh, in... Um, before in 1967. Yeah, before you were born. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. Don't rub it in. So, so, so how, was, how was it? Because you were like considered the youngest and first black woman, youngest first black woman to do this in publishing in the UK. And you have, of course, said that being the first black is, you know, whatever. But you sustained it for such a long time because it was only in 1987 that you left. Can you explain that journey? I, I, as you said, I mean, the first the first books I published um, under the Alison and Busby imprint um, were in 1967, mm -hmm. and um, at the time it was a, an evenings and weekend venture because I had a, a actually at the time. Let me let me go back a bit. I was at university. Uh -huh. And I mm. was at a party given by a friend of mine who was actually having her first novel published. She was an English um, girl that I'd, I'd known since some um, school days. And I was at London University and she had this party. It was also um, an engagement party. She was getting married. And so I was invited as one of her friends and um, one of her fiance's friends um, was somebody he was at university with, and we we talked. We talked about what you're going. We were both studying English literature, and we were saying, "What are you going to do when you graduate?" Oh, I thought I might get into publishing, so did I. Let's start a publishing company. So we decided before we even graduated, we didn't know what it entailed. We were just both interested in writing, in publishing, in 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 poetry, and so we graduated. But you know, not long after, and in, in those days, um. Everybody got married quite young. You went out with somebody a couple of times, then you got married. So I was married to a jazz. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and and pe people always assume that Alison was any you know we had some sort of personal connection no it was just a business relationship and so we decided to start a publishing company to publish poetry cheap poetry because we thought you know young people like us needed to be able to afford it and uh, we we found a way to print them on an electric typewriter and we had no distribution so we'd stop people in the street we didn't know how many copies to print first of all we thought all these millions of people in the country they must be interested in poetry so we had ah! 15, we had 15,000 paperback poetry books and no distribution oh, oh man <laughs> and so the way we sold our books we'd stop people on the street saying are you interested in poetry would you like to buy a copy so that was how we started. And we both, as I said, I had a, a, a jazz musician husband to support. <laughs> mm. And so I, I got a job with, with a publishing company and Clive Harrison got a job with another company. And we did it in evenings and weekends. And then in um, sometime the next year, there was a friend of my husband's um, who was uh, in, in Mykonos in Greece. And he met this... Um, African-American on the island called Sam Greenlee. And Sam had been trying to get his first novel published forever. He tried- And to... nobody would publish it in the US. Yes, so I decided the Atlantic was at all interested because it was kind of a subversive subject. And so this friend of my husband said, oh, I know somebody who started a publishing company. And he sent Sam to me. And I remember I, I borrowed 50 pounds so Sam could stay in London. I could work on the manuscript with him. And we decided this was going to be our first full-time book. So Clive Alice and I both left our jobs and um, we, I worked on the manuscript. We, we tried to get people to give us quotes for the cover. I, we had to do everything ourselves. I did the cover myself with letter set as, you know, you probably never heard of letter set. It was when you, you stenciled letters onto the cover. So I did that. Okay. And uh, then we decided this was a really powerful story. It, it was a bit, I suppose it's quite topical in a way. It's about inclusivity and diversity within the CIA. It's a beautiful story. I, yeah. You know, I, 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 I recommend this book was said by the door to everybody. <laughs> and even like, if there are people are like, we can't find copies, I'm like, you can watch the movie, a very bad copy of it on YouTube. Well, I thought that was like, and it's so relevant even to this day. Well, that's it. I mean, the CIA decided to employ this, this black man who was, um, they trained and he was really intelligent and really good at the job. And he was, you know, th theoretically to show how diverse they were. So he sat by the door, metaphorically. And so people could see that they had a black person working for them. And meanwhile, he was in, in his own time training freedom fighters in Chicago. So it was a kind of a subversive role he was also playing. And um, we decided this was a, a, a book was so exciting, we wanted to get this serialized. So we sent the manuscript to, to the Observer saying, you know, would you like to serialize this first novel we're about to publish? And of course they sent it back saying, well, you know, you ought to know, we, we, we don't serialize fiction and we certainly wouldn't serialize a black power first novel like this. Okay, now mm. we were too young to know any better. So we sent it back to them saying, you're wrong. <laughs> And they I love ended it. up doing it. They ended up saying, okay. <laughs> so it was serialized in the, it was extracted in the Observer magazine in um, 1969. And we published it in March 1969. And we went on from there. And we, the thing was... And we, it became a movie, which, which got banned shortly movie. after it came out. It became a, a movie, which kind of, I think it, there was some people assume it was suppressed by the FBI or the CIA or whoever because it was it was quite a subversive movie, and it was actually um, we Sam could have sold the right to a Hollywood um, company, but he wanted to keep control of it. So it was a it was made with a black um, director called Ivan Dixon. The music was by Herbie Hancock, and it was it was you know a really quite a powerful became a cult movie, and mm. the, it wasn't. The financial benefit wasn't for Alison and Busby, but it was it was the the book that kind of got us on the road because then we we sold translation rights to lots of different countries. We sold paper rack rights. We sold American rights back to America, and we went on from there. and And we 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 did lots of different kinds of um, uh, fiction and nonfiction, political books, children's books, all mm. sites, all, all kinds of writing. It wasn't it wasn't simply a black company, although obviously I, I was 
interested in black subject matter because that was my perspective. And I, I had come through the whole of my education in Britain without reading a single black writer on my official curriculum. So I was really interested to read outside the canon I was allowed to read. And I, I read the Harry Lapidum Writer series, all those books. I read books that have come out in America. And so we were publishing black writers alongside writers from France, Hungary, anywhere else. We were publishing good books. And that, that was a perspective from which I was um, publishing. I, I Auntie was, Margaret, I, I, can, you, can you sit back a little bit because we can't okay. see you fully, like your face. Yeah. I, um, I'm holding my, I don't know how, this is the first time I've ever done this, Suki. No, this is actually perfect. This is absolutely perfect. You're good now. Okay. <laughs> if you can hold it. <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. Anyway, but amongst, amongst the people that you signed um, in, um, with Alison and Busby is C.R. James, who went to school with your dad. Like, mm -hmm. did you have problems editing him? Like, uh, where you're like, okay, uncle, I'm sorry, you're going to have to cut this out. How, no, how did that work? No, I mean, the thing is, we started publishing C.L.R. James. Well, as you said, I, I knew him because of my father's connection with him going back to their school days. And it was astonishing. At the time we were, pub we were publishing, most of his work was out of print, including mm. The Black Jacobins, his, which is his big book. So Big book, yeah. I decided I wanted to bring him back into print. So we started with three volumes of selected writings. I, I, I would select the book, the, the, the pieces, whether they were lectures, essays or whatever and I would go and he was then living in in Brixton in the in the mm. race today office and I'd go and discuss with him the context within which he wrote the the pieces and he'd he'd talk a bit and I'd record him and then those were the little introductions on the top of each of the pieces we had in the three volumes of selected writings the first one was called the future in the present then there mm. was one called spheres of existence and the last one was called at the rendezvous of victory so we published some selected writings by C.L.R. James. We published um, his book called Nkrumah and the Ghana Revolution, which actually hadn't been published before. We mm. reprinted the Black Jacobins, which he'd first published in the 30s and had been totally out, out of print. And yeah. it went on like that. We kind of brought him back into, the, into currency, if you like. Into the fold. Absolutely. And then, I mean, you've got other names. You, you published like Butchie and Macheta. Chester Holmes. Okay, who didn't you publish actually during those days? Well, we published. Can we start there. <laughs> who did? What? What didn't Alison and Busby publish? Well, we, well, the thing is, we we start, We published both new writers, and we reprinted writers who we thought should still be in print who'd gone out of print, or whether it was C.L.R. James or George Lamming, and and we built writers up from scratch. I mean, when when we started publishing Bucci. Actually, let me go back a bit further, because I found just, I was sent just the other day, the first article I ever wrote for a, for a, for a British publication for the New Statesman in 1966. I wrote an article called Skin Deep. And in fact, they asked me to write a column after that. And I, I, didn't, I didn't do it because I was too busy trying to be a publisher. And uh, in fact, there's also a, a literary agent got in touch saying, you know, can I represent you? Are you going to write another book? But I, I, I didn't take that part. But Bucci did get a column in the New Statesman. She had, and out of that column came her first novel, which is an autobiographical novel. And, and we published all Bucci's works from, from that first no novel onwards. So it was like a, she was doing something I might have done had I taken up the, the New Statesman's offer. But I mean, it, it was completely a different um, scenario because I, I was trying to give Bucci some, to, to, to highlight her story because she was writing a really important story that hadn't been told, hadn't been seen in terms of British literature um, it, it, or English literature coming out of this country. So it was in terms of what we published, we published what we wanted to publish. We published things that nobody else was publishing. In fact, let me tell you the biggest compliment somebody ever paid to me was to say, mm -hmm. you never knew what Alison and Busby was going to do next, but you knew it was going to be interesting. <laughs> ah, fantastic. Obviously. Um, yes, please. Molara says, can you move a little bit back again? Uh -oh. uh, I, I think I've you, got to yeah. find a way to prop up my phone somehow. Oh, I, 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 I told you 
use your new daughters of africa i i've been using it like fantastically it's I'm it's a great try. book okay yeah well right now i'm That's using girl woman either because i wanted to show everybody this <laughs> no, which I'm is available in prestige books in nairobi oh yes you've got the original the, the daughters of africa this is the 19th and we started it predecessor <laughs> yes when They're candida asked good. you they to they edit daughters of africa you know they're, they're good for propping up phones as door stoppers offensive weapons paperweight <laughs> <laughs> and they're absolutely amazing reads yeah exactly okay so let's go back to, back to 92 when when alison um, when when canada asked you to 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 edit daughters of africa tell us about that particular journey how did you select the people how did you go about it and everything well i actually met canada um towards the end of the 80s she was at the time I met her, she was working for a feminist company called Pandora Press. And they had just published, um, it was a volume, I think, of British women writers with two editors. And we met and we discussed and we decided, okay, I'm going to do a volume on black women around the world, me one alone. So they had two editors, just in English, just in Britain. I did the world on my own. <laughs> and the way oh, I wow. did it, the way I did it, because you know there wasn't lots of money um, available, so I would just go to all the books in in my house. I, I kind of live in a library, so there's books and magazines everywhere. So I would go and choose what I wanted and put things together. And uh, I got the manuscript together. I sent it to Canada. I, I, in fact, everybody was shipping. My, my brother, who speaks German, because he, he spends a lot of time in Germany, did some of the German translations. Just as in, in the new one, my, my, my sister did some of the French translations. My, sis, my sister, who sadly died... Um, Passed away, yeah. So um, it was just put together out of love and mm. um, a lot of energy. And Canada moved from Pandora to... I think Harper Collins, and then she moved to Cape. And every time she moves, I followed her. So I was like a literary stalker. And I ended up <laughs> at Cape. Okay. It came out from Jonathan Cape in 1992. And mm. it had more than 200 women in it. it. It started off with traditional writing, anonymous writing, and it went right the way through um, to the present day. And it, it, it's it's had known writers, writers who are then unknown, who've since then become known. I mean, writers like, mm -hmm. I can't think, Jackie Kay was in it. So it was a, a, in the same way as New Daughters of Africa was trying to show the span of writing um, that black women, women of African descent around the world are capable of. I was trying to mm -hmm. do that back then. And it's, it, mm -hmm. it's quite a difficult thing because think of all the people that we've left out. And yeah, that, absolutely. That was, you know, if, 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 if you said, try and do a one volume that covers all the women of European descent around the world from time immemorial, you couldn't put it into one volume. Absolutely so, not. You know, I could do another one tomorrow and the next day and the next day and still not have exhausted all the talent that there is. So it started in 1992, as you said. And somehow the book went out of print. Um, Canada had left Cape and... Um, it was quite an expensive book to produce in the first place because we had to pay permission fees to all the people who's, who published the things I take publishers from. The permissions fees to pay to every publisher, every agent. And so it was quite a, a pricey book in terms of permission fees. And so when it went out of print, it was, was kind of hard to think of how are we going to pay all these thousands of pounds again to all those publishers and editors and agents to reprint it. But we wanted mm. it to have an ongoing impact. And we thought, well, you know, okay, if we can't reprint that, we always wanted to do another volume. So we thought, okay, let's try a different approach, which will actually reflect what we were trying to do, which had a more than just a financial bearing on, on, on why something should get published. So we thought, okay, we're going to be upfront with all the possible contributors, tell them what we want to do is to put together a volume that will have some kind of ongoing effect that will benefit African women, African women writers, people who want to learn about literature. And so every 
contributor I approached, including you, Zuki, did me the favor <laughs> of saying, yes, we will let you use something from us and we will contribute this without fee so that the, the money can go towards a special award. And I am thrilled that the, that award, which was a collaboration between the publisher, Myriad Editions, and mm -hmm. SOAS, the School of African, Oriental and African Studies of London University, mm -hmm. and International Student House, collaborated and people contributed funds as well as royalties to make sure that an award would enable an African woman student coming from the continent to study at SOAS free of charge with free accommodation. And, and you've just announced the first, the first winner this year, which I'm very excited about, like two weeks ago, you know? It's amazing. And I, I haven't yet met her, but it, it's, it's great to have one welcome into, into the family, the, the, the new daughter's family. You know, when I, I told you that what it is, I call, the fact that all of the contributors were so generous, I have awarded mm. you all something I call VOTAS, which stands for <laughs> Venerable Order of True African Sisterhood. So yes, I remember that. Up. It's actually Perfect. right here, yes. In fact, I think I'll be adding that like every time I sign off on things now. Exactly, and, and people will say, what does that mean? And I'll say it means that you and everybody <laughs> else were so generous that we were able to do this book. So it's, it's not just that I edited it. I, I didn't even curate it. As you know, I didn't write to people saying, I want a piece on this subject or that subject. Mm. All I did was specify that you know, it had to be within a certain length because obviously you see how big the book yeah. is and it could have been twice yeah. the size and there yeah. were a lot of people oh, but... who are not in it not because they don't deserve to be in it but because either i had the wrong email address or they were too late delivering or something so anybody who's not in it who thinks that i left them out deliberately i didn't <laughs> there's some wonderful writers in it and there's some wonderful writers who are not in it but i am really wouldn't make it it has this ongoing legacy of the award that will enable other women from Africa to read work by their, their peers, their, their mothers, their sisters, and, and be inspired. Uh, yeah, and everybody, everybody who's watching, if you are in Kenya, you can order it from Prestige Books. They deliver all over the country. If you are in South Africa, you can order from Afroculture, because it's Women's Month, There's a and it's a woman called Jonathan mm. Ball. So you can get the South African editions through Jonathan Ball. And there's a publisher mm. in America called Amistad, part of Harper Collins. So they have a, an American edition. So, you know, it's, it's available wherever you are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And in the UK, of course. And I think the beauty of it really is um, when you didn't give us a theme to write, it was so beautiful because every story that I've been reading, it's like a new revelation. Every poem that I read, it's, I don't expect it. So I'm surprised every time I'm like, okay, what is this person going to talk about? What is this? And it's, it's, it's such a journey. It's such a beautiful journey. And um, I think uh, so far, I'm the only person I know who's actually read each and every, one, every story. <laughs> and I'm very proud of myself for it. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, um, it's, 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 it's been also really beautiful for me because I have, I have found a lot of writers that I didn't know about, you know? Yes, and, and, and so it was like, I, I, I always make the argument, a few, a, few, a few months ago, somebody asked me, you know, whether I could make one of those 10 best list of African or whatever, whatever. I say, I can't, I can't, because firstly, I only read in English. So that means I'm missing all the writers who are writing in, in French, in Portuguese, in Spanish, in uh, Yoruba, in uh, Shona, and so forth and so on. Well, I read Shona, but in, in, in Kiswahili, all the other languages. But now with this book, I am, I'm like, I, I'm discovering people. I'm like, wow, why didn't I know this person? And I just kind of feel a, a little bit stupid, but I know for a fact that I won't be writing any top 10 best writers you should read from Africa anytime soon. I refuse. <laughs> there are just so many. There are too many. There are too many. And, and as you say, this book has people that 
some some of them are well known. Of course, you know, it has the names that a lot of people have heard of, whether it's Chimamanda or Zadie Smith or some of the well known names. And and even it goes back to the nineteenth century to earlier. The first actually the first um, it, it's earlier than that, yeah. yeah the first writer the eighteenth century is a, is yeah. a Nigerian three nineteen hundred. Born in, in the nineteenth century. Was it there? What's what's the date? Have you got the book in front of you? I can't remember the date she was born, but it's it's certainly yes. Uh, I've, 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 I've got it in front of me. The um, Nana Asmau mm -hmm. uh, Lamentations. Yeah, and um, she was she was writing. She was she was born in seventeen ninety three. Exactly, seventeen ninety three to eighteen sixty three. Yep. So we have we have writers born in the um. 1790s and we have writers born in the 1990s and everything in absolutely <laughs> yes now we've got some questions from the audience so that i don't hog you all the time mm -hmm. which i can totally do for like hours um uh, mukoma says they're not difficult questions people <laughs> mukoma says can you please talk about the black lives matter in britain the moment we are in historically and how you see it changing black publishing i think just to just to just to add a little bit to that, what I had in mind was I also wanted to know whether you feel that letting go of Alison and Busby uh, might have, you know, uh, set us back in publishing a little bit, you know. No, I, I think there is always room for for, for publishing to include us, and I, I I am always trying to encourage people to see publishing as an option. Because sometimes I, I go to an event and I say to the audience, you know, a mostly black audience perhaps, and I say, put up your hands if you want to be a writer. Mm. And a lot of hands will go up. Mm. And I'll say, put up your hand if you want to be a publisher. And virtually no hands will go up. Mm. But we have to be on both sides. And we can do both. I mean, when I think of some of the writers that we are, we, we are familiar with as, as stars now, like mm. Penny Morrison, she was also an editor. Yeah. Alice Walker, she also published. Flora Nwapa, she published. So you can be a writer and a publisher. And I, I think one of the things I would, I'm always hoping to do is encourage other people to be publishers, as well, even if they want to be writers as well. And I, I'm, I'm thrilled that there are people like um, Bibi Bakari Yusuf, who started Cassava Republic Press, who is a wonderful publisher. There, there are other... I'm trying to, my brain goes... Lola! And I think, Lola I publishes like, and she's a writer. Lola Shoneyin. I mean, Ella Olfrey is another wonderful editor. Um, there uh -huh. are other editors in the, in the mainstream industry, like Charmaine Lovego. We Agents, we need agents. Elise Dillsworth, a fantastic. She works for 13 years at Virago. She now has her own agency. So we need people in every strand of the industry. Right? Absolutely. Sure. And we, we need them... We need people so that we not only see ourselves represented in the literature, but we can be making the choices of what to take on, how to present exactly. what is taken on, where to find what is taken on, all those things. We're, we're not just saying to the publishers who are them and we are us and will you do this for us? No, we can be on both sides of the... The ones who do it, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, the thing is, I, I'm always happy to help, uh, if I have time, how mm. anybody who wants to ask me questions, you know, they don't have to make the mistakes I made. And I, I think mm. back, you know, I, who did I have to ask? And, and how yeah. young was I? I didn't know anything about life, let alone publishing when I started. And I, mm -hmm. I was inspired by seeing somebody like Toni Morrison, who was then mm -hmm. an editor at um, Random House. And, you know, I, I did... Um, meet her and, and talk with her. And she, in fact, I, I'm always um, mindful of what she said to me once. When she was publishing, being an editor within, a, within a, a mainstream publishing company, and she published many black writers, um, including people like Angela Davis and um, Muhammad Ali, and lots of writers who came through because of Tony. But she said that she had to make sure that those writers did well, otherwise, she might face being told, well, black writers don't sell. Well, they, they, they don't sell, exactly. And I think uh, that's and we, have we have to be wary of being, putting ourselves always in that position where we're depending on other people to tell us what we can do. We Absolutely. have to be able to do what 
we want to do because you know and and also the other thing that i i've come across over the years is is it's not that people have anything against black writers but there's this mm. myth first of all that black people don't read or black people don't buy books or that if you write if you're publishing an, a book by an african writer the subject matter has to be nobody's like, interested not like that and it so, should be a certain type of topic so you know we have to be part of the discussion from the get go we have to be able to say i want to publish this because it's a good book not just because it's a black book or a book by an african yeah. because it's a good book it's and a well written book apologize for anything okay uh edwish draw who's one of the new daughters has a question for you in the audience she That's says it. will you write your memoirs <laughs> Well, and she says, well, before the end of this year, preferably. Sorry, Edwin, it can't be before well, the end of this year. She's very busy. <laughs> yeah. If you write yours, I'll write mine. <laughs> <laughs> and she also asks, are there, is there any advice that you would give for being a fearless publisher while we wait for, me for your memoirs? <laughs> is there any what? Advice, advice for being a pub fearless well, publisher. Uh, the advice is first of all, read a lot. Mm. Um, so uh, and look at what's being published and and where um, you can. I mean, the thing is, in these days, there are different ways of publishing. There's a lot of online publishing that goes on. There are people who've done interesting things who are still doing things. There are people. I mean, what is what is publishing? Let's start from what is publishing. Publishing is making public something. So mm. if, if you photocopy something six times, you're publishing. Mm. It's spreading the word. So you, you, can, you can apply for jobs to get into the publishing industry that way. You can look at starting your own ventures. You, you start, you're a publisher. H how did you start this, this venture we're on now? Yeah. <laughs> you decided I, I just, to do it. You did it. Well, I just, yeah, I guess. I you guess. Know, I just did. did. We don't have to get permission from anybody to have initiatives. And mm. you know, we try, if they're any good, we'll get support from our, our brothers and sisters. And, and we, we go one step at a time. That's all we can do. And it's not a question of starting. I, I hear people who say, well, I can't do this because I haven't got enough money. Well, I had no money whatsoever. And, mm. you know, you, you have to start from where you are, from what you can manage. You don't have to start overreaching yourself. You can... I don't know. She, you, you, you have to think, what, is, what do I want to achieve? Why am I doing this? Am yeah, I doing absolutely. this because I want to be rich and famous mm. or because I believe it? <laughs> I don't think you'll find it in publishing. Exactly. Molara wants to know. <laughs> Molara wants to know, are you wearing a okay? This What I'm wearing, actually, uh -huh. this, this is a dress I bought. This is a charity shop in Shepherd's Bush in London called Mama mm. Beashara. It's one, it's run um, on, on behalf of Kenyan women. And everything mm. that you buy there is made by Kenyan women and the money goes back to them to start small business. So I bought this in Mama Beashara. Oh, fantastic. From Kenya. All right. And this is, um, I'm wearing something here, which is a Buzz Bee. It was given to my one of my cousins. It's a bee, Buzz Bee, get it? Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Tash says she saw you at Africa Right and she was just in absolute awe. I think everybody's in absolute. Every time we see you, like, I'm like, oh my God, I'm in the same space as Margaret Boss. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, you, know, you know what? But, I, I suffer from the imposter syndrome. So whenever you say things like that, I think, you know, what does she think I am? Who, who do you think I am? An OBE for starts. <laughs> <laughs> OBI woman. OBI woman. <laughs> 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 right. Um, talking about OBE, how did you feel when you were selected for that? Did you were you like excited or were you were like what well, British Empire? You know, I was. You know, I, I I got a letter saying you know we want to offer you this or whatever, and I was reluctant. So, you know, I, I I'm quite a low profile person, and so I asked people. They and people said yes, you have to take it for this reason. Yes, you've got to take it to show young black people that they get things from. 
you know, awards for things other than sport or music. So all sorts of people were giving me advice on why I should take this medal, this gong, this, this award. And I still hadn't said yes. And I was, you know, I was quite happy to continue the life I had without any fancy medals. And then I got a phone call one morning from, I don't know, who can't remember who it was, it must have been 10 Downing Street, saying, you know, did you get our letter? And can you do it on this day? <laughs> and I, 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 I said, no, I can't do that day. I got a meeting that day. <laughs> and then, and, the, and then and the quid say we'll I, change I, I the dates. The palace, saying, did you get our letter? <laughs> I think I sort of said yes out of politeness, and mm. you know, if if it, if it helps anybody else, I'm I'm happy. But it makes no real difference in terms of my lifestyle or you know getting me a special mm. table at some fancy restaurant or anything. You know, it's it's just. Mm. It's something that I hope will encourage other people. And, and I'm proud to have got it because it means that something that an African woman has done has been recognized outside the wider circle. And it's not that I Absolutely. think we are in the margins. I, I, the thing I would like everybody to take from this is that we are centered. I am the mm. center of my world. You are the center of your world. We're not in anybody's Absolutely. margin. We are Absolutely. Somebody wants to know, will there be a reprint of Daughters of Africa? Well, if we can find a way to get around all those expensive permission fees that, that we had to pay the first time around, that, that's all that's holding us back. Because obviously, if before you, get, you start publishing, you've got to pay £10,000. It's, it's quite, of a, quite a big ask. So we have to find a way to be able to afford that or some grant or maybe maybe the publishers we, we originally asked will, will relent and not be so um, hard on us in terms of charging permission fees but I, I hope there's some way we can we can bring it back because you know if there's nothing in there that I, I would regret having it put in there and I'd like more people to and at, what I find about Dalton of Africa it actually inspired so many people I mean, you, mm. you, you had the vision. Uh, there are people who said that because they read Daughters of Africa, it inspired them to become writers or to continue writing or, or mm. to realize that you could write um, as an African woman and, and have find an audience. So I don't know. I, I, I hope there'll be a way to bring it back into print. But I certainly want to do another volume of, of the same That would be amazing. But that would be totally I, I, amazing. <laughs> but you I, and I, I, I'm even happy to edit for free. I don't know. Another question: How many people? I, you know, this is the first time I've ever done this. Uh huh. So I, I, you know, I, I hope I'm sorry if I'm talking over you because I'm just sort of seeing things swimming in front of my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. No, I mean this is things for for you young people, not an old lady like me. <laughs> Well, you don't look a day over 21, Auntie Margaret. So thank oh, you. Listen, we don't know. Listen, I went, anyway. I went to a birthday party this week of a friend of my partner's, and she is 104. Wow. She's a wonderful woman called Ivy, and, and I'm mm -hmm. aiming to be like Ivy when I grow up. <laughs> well, you, 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 you're doing it so far. You look good. You look great. <laughs> um. Troy is asking, I think you've answered that already. You've answered how we can get more publishers and editors, uh, black, more black publishers and editors. So, well, yeah. I, I think we just have to help each other, talk to each other. If, we, if you know anybody who's in the industry at any level, I mean, and, and the industry encompasses bookshops, literary agents, publishers, and think about- Critics. It's not just an editorial department. The publishing company encompasses publicity, sales, accounts. So you get the publishing through another department other than the editorial department. And, and you have to really do your, some homework to see how best you can get into the system, if that's what you're aiming at. But as I said, mm. there are other ways you can start your own venture. You have started this wonderful venture I'm on now, and other people can start websites, different ways of getting work out there. So I, I don't think there's any one way. And I think anybody you know who's already in there 
will mm. be only too glad to help or, or give any advice if, if they can. And, and I certainly would. And I, I, I am just Absolutely. thrilled whenever I find somebody who's in publishing, who's found their own way in there, whether or not I help them. It's such a thrill because it, it's so necessary. Right. You have, you have judged like a litany of literary prizes, mm. you know. And in fact, you are doing so right now. Uh, with the booker, what's it like? The you know how hectic is it? Are you do you do you do you say yes because oh this is something that you really want to do or do you do you get a thrill of reading all this new material or do you say yes because oh, okay you have nothing to do with your day at that time? Well, I I have never judged a prize that is as weighty as the Booker Prize, with as many things to read and in the current situation it's even more difficult because okay we, we as judges there are five judges and, and the judges are all very different and I respect them all we don't all know each other in fact we've never all been in the same room together because of lockdown mm -hmm. and we've read you know more than 160 submissions and oh. most of those because of lockdown we've had to read on screen on pdfs so that's been challenging but on the other hand to be reading as your job is always mm. going to be a pleasure. And it's, it's not a question of, to me, judging a prize is a way to see, a, a way of seeing what's out there, what wonderful, talented writers there are. But mm. in a way, it's more than the winner because you get to the short list, before that you get the long list, and it's a showcase a lot of different writers. To me, the most important bits are, are, are not necessarily the one person who wins, as, as well as all the others who are worth reading who don't win. Because, you know, there has to be one winner, but that doesn't mean absolutely. That you're only going to read one book. I hope everybody will read as many books as they can. And as they can, absolutely. There, there, there's so many books worth reading, and there's so many books we had to let go because we have to get a short list of a certain length and so we have to say, well, I'd love to add another 50, but I'm not allowed to. So mm. there it goes. Another question. Looking at your lustrous career, is there anything that you would change? That's from Ms. Ms. Weiner. She wants to know, is there anything you'd change? Is there something you'd do better? Something you'd maybe not do? I, I'd do everything better <laughs> if I could. <laughs> But I, I think that the point is, I started very young, and mm. I think that's the best time to start anything because you don't. First of all, you don't know what can go wrong, mm. and you don't have to worry about having I don't know mortgages or dependents. So you can be quite brave. The younger you are, the more adventurous maybe you are. But I think there's mm -hmm. never a time where you can say, I'm too young to do this or too old to do that. that in fact, one of the things I, I remember is one of the oldest first novelists that I published when Alison Busby was 85, mm. writing her first novel. So, that is awesome. You know, it's not that you have to be young. At to such an age in order to do it, exactly. Yeah, so I think you do whatever you want at any age and mm. take advice, but do what you want so that you don't regret not doing something because somebody told you not to do it, but you really wanted to do it. So I can't think of anything that um, I can say I would have done differently. I mean, I, you can always do things better. Better, and Society changes. So the society that I was starting out in is different from what we're in now. And I think back when I started, I was really treated as a sort of freak Mm. When I think of some of the publicity that came out about Alice and Busby and some of the headlines, one of them I always remember, it said, the girl from Ghana goes into publishing. Mm. And that to me, okay. was short, that was shorthand for saying, you know, African girl can read. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And that, actually, I also remember, because when I was, when we were starting out, we were trying, you know, trying to get jobs to, to subsidize our, publishing habit as it was going to become. And I remember applying for a job by post, uh, getting an interview by post, turning up at the publishing company, and the person on the door phoned upstairs and said, there's a black girl down here who says she's got an interview. Oh, man. So 
that was how rare it was back in the day. Certainly now things have changed. And I, but I would still like to see more people involved in the more public people. industry, as well as more people being published. I think there are more black writers who are getting, getting a, a chance to be published. But I, I don't want it to be some sort of a, a fad. Token. Yeah. Everybody's got an, some initiative. Everybody says, yes, I believe in Black Lives Matter. Let's publish a few black writers. And then you know, it'll blow over and they'll forget why they're doing it or, or it'll be not part of the, the general system. So I, I, I think we have to just hope that reality is, is what sets in. We are part of the system. We're, we're part of society. We, we are not some special little afterward. We, we, we are central to who we are and what we want to be, what we want to read, the stories we want to tell. And I want that to be the main thing that we take, take away, away from this moment. That we, we okay, can be. We, we may have all sorts of things to, to overcome and, and we can have allies mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. every ethnicity. But in the mm -hmm. end, we have to try and be the best kind of person that we can be without mm. being made to feel yeah we don't want to be good we, we don't we, we don't want to be good black writers we just want to be good writers and you, good publishers and, and, and good, good writers editors. who are black but you i mean yeah. i bet you don't get up every morning and look in the mirror and say oh gosh i'm black again no <laughs> <laughs> i've got another question uh a bit more serious this time um you you were one of the patrons for the Etisalat Prize, a prize that this whole continent got really excited about. What went wrong there? Because I honestly you know we we, we I, need I more know, literary prizes. It, it was it was, it was a great prize. initiative, and it was it had a lot of people backing it. I I don't know what went wrong. I I, I know that there was a change of ownership, um, in the in the company in and, the leadership. So I, I, I think that might have had something to do with it. But I honestly don't know the, the background to it. But in the end, we had, to, as patients, we felt that we had to step back and say, well, you know, we, we can't um, be supporting something that we, we, we don't find, um, we, we not, don't yeah. know what's going on. So we had to step back. But, I, you know, I hope there'll be, there, there are other initiatives, I mean, in terms of prizes, in terms of, um, I, I, my, my mind's gone blank, but there are certainly, as you, I'm sure, will know, prizes that reward African writers. This is a Kane Prize. So there are other prizes, there are other initiatives, and, and there are prizes that aren't specifically for African writers that we can be mm. part of, that we can win. And, you mm. know, there, the, those are all the things... Oh, that we, we can do. sponsor! Sorry? Oh, that we can sponsor! Yeah, that we can sponsor, that we, that we can... You know, there are a lot of people who could back literature more than they do, who could put, put money behind writers, behind publishers from Africa, and make a difference. And I, I hope that rather than seeing literature and publishing as some sort of luxury, people will mm -hmm. see that actually it, it is important. It, you know, literature is political, whether or not it's being labeled as politics. Absolutely. All, all the things that go into why a book is published, where a book is published, how a book is distributed. Distributed. All those things tie into... And reviewed. Um, yeah, and, 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 and reviewed. We have to be part of every bit of the industry and, and we have to also say, well, why aren't there more publishers in Africa or the Caribbean mm -hmm. or anywhere else? We have to say, mm -hmm. well, that is part of our history and part of yeah. our history um, takes it, it takes into consideration colonialism, imperialism, the fact that those early publishers who published African writers were publishing in their educational series. So they were mm -hmm. publishing books for a textbook market in Africa yeah. or, or the West Indies not for a trade market in, in, in Britain. So they were not seen as central to the, mm. the canon. They were somehow um, educational. And, and the covers would be educational rather than um, inspiring in the way that trade covers are. So, you know, we have to say that it's all part of 
an ongoing process and we, we can learn from what's happened. We, we can move on. We can try different things. And I hope that um, uh, I will see more people being publishers, more writers being published who deserve to be published. And that there are not any divisions between us. We're not in competition. You know, I just yeah. want to use only one hand or two mm-hmm. hands to count the numbers of editors there are who are from Africa or who are black or color. I want to say there are too many to count. Absolutely. In the- fact, I, I was, um, somebody was showing me, uh, somebody in this house was showing me earlier, there was a review of uh, Jennifer Nansubuga Makumbi today, and it said of her, a new star is born. And I was taken aback because I'm like, this is a third book. Why is she a new star? But she was being, this was a review in the, in, 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 in the U.S. And I started thinking, well, there's something that um, Ama Taido once said to me because I think it was like on my third or fourth book, she said to me, I said to her, I just saw something that referred to me as an emerging writer. When do I stop being emerging? And she said to me, Baby, you don't stop being emerging until you're a veteran, if you're a black person. <laughs> <laughs> and so perhaps what we need to stop being is get this emerging and veteran thing every time as a way of describing yeah. writing by black people. Yeah, so that would be so lovely. Right. You're so right. You're so right. You know, there's nothing between emerging and veteran. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody else is asking, which writers would you include in the future Daughters of Africa anthology? Um, oh, wow. Yeah. Well, there are many who weren't in this. I'm sure if you think of any writer I should have included, I'll probably include them if I can. There are so many writers, and we're going back to the 18th century, the 19th century. And, and you remember that this is a, an anthology that uses translation as well. So mm-hmm. we're not only talking yeah. about people who write in English. There are, there are people who are translated from Spanish, from, from African languages, from French. From, so think of the world. Think of the countries around the world who, who might haven't in, been you know, represented through their writers. And there are so many I would like to put in the next volume. And you know, whether I'll get an opportunity or not, I don't know. I mean, and they, maybe other people will do similar things. But it's just so amazing, the, the range of... of of, of creativity there is that comes out of the African sisterhood. Absolutely. Auntie Margaret, we're almost out of time and I could have just talked to you forever and ever and ever, but I think you have more books to read for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the book and stuff and everything. And, and on that note, you did actually mention one of your long listed writers is, um, uh, was imprisoned on 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 Friday. She is out now. Titi has been has been released, and I chatted with her yesterday, and she um, was in good spirits given everything that she underwent. Does do you have any statement as a chair as the booker? Uh, did you guys come up with a statement? Is there anything that we should know as this audience? No, I, I, the thing is, uh, as a judge, I'm, I'm not part of the Booker Foundation. You know, it's, it's mm. a different thing to be asked to be a judge. I'm not representing the, the charity, the Booker charity. But obviously, mm. I think it's, it's a sad thing where somebody like um, Titi has to be arrested for a peaceful demonstration you know it, it's sort of it, we, we should all be very concerned about something that that, that uh, places a, a writer or any person in that situation but it just again it goes to demonstrate when I say that writing is not separate from politics it's not mm. you can't say I'm a writer therefore I can forget about politics mm. you are a fully formed human being and so of course wherever you are in the world whichever country you are, it's likely that you may get involved in the politics and that you may have to pay the price in some way or other. And it's, 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 it's happened throughout the decades, throughout the centuries, yes, that women and, and writers have been penalised for their political views. So I, I'm hoping that it's something we're not going to see any more of and that this is going to have a positive outcome for Sitsi and, and for everybody. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Auntie Margaret, this has been an enriching discussion. Everybody else at 2103, 
we are having the final festival after party. So join me right here in about five, six minutes. Thank you, Auntie Margaret, and have a lovely Thank evening. Thank, thanks for inviting me. I hope I haven't disappointed you. Cause I, I'm oh, you've been I'm, amazing. I'm and this is the reason why I'm not having any other festival <laughs> after this, this year. Like, <laughs> Who can come after you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Everybody thank you so much, you. love. Absolutely, Auntie Margaret. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming, for joining this conversation. See you at, in about seven minutes. Bye. Bye.